should get together and do something about um, remembering this great man that is a good friend of, of our Center for Process Studies now through none other than Jorge Pixley or George Pixley. And I thought also that this would be a way of introducing the idea of um, creating a series about how the poet of the universe, God as the poet of the universe, works through the poets of the nations, especially, especially those that really begin to look at the world in a different way and write about that. And Ernesto would be the, the first that I would like to bring up with that, but it's, he's certainly not the last. And I'd like to remind you, among other things, that Mao Zedong was also a poet, and uh, several of great, great uh, revolutionary leaders have either themselves been, been poets or have admire poetry. Uh, I understand that, that, um, that Che Guevara and Fidel Castro always wrote with some kind of book of poems and would read to each other. So poetry is intimately linked, I believe, with, with uh, transformative power. And I'm so glad that at the conference that we're going to have, we are talking about the transformative power of art and, among other things, the transformative power of words. And um, so I think by the time that happens, some of these ideas will be shared with other people as well. But at least my own personal um, interest would be that I would want to keep on building up on this and hopefully create uh, either a, 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 um, a series of documents that could be posted uh, or a, uh, even a, a book that could be um, produced. So um, I want to use primarily the what I consider to be the most important pedagogical suggestion by, by Whitehead, and that is that the professor, the teacher, the educator is to be a seducer. In other words, he has to really make the students fall in love with the subject that, that he or she is presenting. And in this case, for me, I think I don't think it's that difficult a task because the subject of poetry and the subject of Ernesto Cardenal in particular is, um, is so wonderful that I, I don't think I would have too much of a difficulty seducing you into, into um, falling in love with his ideas, with his, his, with his own uh, biography, with the kind of person that he was, and that you then follow up and do the kinds of things that need to be done in terms of uh, reading more and more. Look at this Cantico Cosmico, Cosmic Canticle. I can't possibly even summarize it for you today. But I can do a couple of other things that point you in the direction of um, falling in love more and more and more with Ernesto Cardenal. When um, God as Poet of the World was translated into German, the word that, the, that was used um, was not Dichter, which is the most common word in German for poet. And, and it's Gott als Poet der Welt. So the translator used a very seldom um, uh, quoted word, or seldom utilized word, poet, which uh, is um, Greek and Latin in origin, rather than the more Germanic dichter. And I think they were doing the right thing, because the word poet, of course, is the one that is the oldest, and it goes back to the biblical language and uh, to uh, not, not just Latin, but even before Latin. It is the word used in the Septuagint to talk about the character of God as God begins the creation. So it's wonderful that this book by, by, uh, by Jorge Pixley, which is about creation, it says the biblical, philosophical, and cultural creation, has in its co cover simply the first chapter of Genesis in Greek. Not, not all of it, but just the beginning of the chapter of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Genesis. And of course, it's en arhe epoesen, epoesen hoteos, tos uranos kai tangen, in the beginning created God, po poetically created. So the word po poetry is right there on, already. And so all of the work of God, of course, is poetic word, is, is, is creative word. And so the creativity that we as humans uh, participate in is of divine origin. And so that's why I was thinking that a series of events around the issue of God as the poet of the universe as mediated through the poets of the nations would, would be kind of an interesting thing. Um, Ernesto Cardenal, before he wrote this, well, actually, he wrote this first, and then he began uh, writing his memoirs. and. Then he uh, wrote about his time in Granada. Um, Granada is uh, a city in 
the Granada he's talking about is a city in, in Nicaragua. Of course, there is the original Granada is in Spain, in the region of Al Andalus, which was so um, uh, populated and so enriched by the uh, Muslim and Arabic culture, the Mozarabic. That's where the Alhambra is, and if you you, you have to put that in your in your uh, list of places to go. It's a fantastic place. I've been there three times. I had the honor of taking my uh, nephew on his 21st birthday to go through the Alhambra, and um, I think it is extremely important to, to uh, try to see the way in which the uh, Muslim culture uh, and the Muslim religion and the Arabic culture interacted with the uh, with uh, the Christian and the Jewish. Uh, religions and cultures in, in Al-Andalus. But then later on, there were other Granadas, and so this Granada is in the, ta- in the country of Nicaragua. It's a beautiful city, and um, of it, he, uh, Ernesto Cardenal says that it is the perfect city in terms of what ideals, the ideals of the perfect city that were generated in this country uh, uh, by uh, Henry David uh, Thoreau. He says, Granada had, at, at that time when I was there, about 20,000 uh, inhabitants, and one could go from one end of the city to the other in two to three hours, um, from the lake to the, to the cemetery. Coronel, another poet in, in Granada, used to say that it was the ideal size for, this, for a city, according to Henry David Thoreau. For Thoreau, all cities should be just like his own city of Concord in Massachusetts, that one could walk from one extreme, one end to the end, in a very short time, and only walking, not horse. And that's what he did. He only walked. Also, Coronel, this other um, um, Nicaraguan poet, said that the size of Granada was more or less the same size as the Athens of he said per- pericles, or per- per- pericles, yeah. So that imagine living in a city like that and having teachers that tell you that about the city where you're living. This, this book is uh, unfortunately still not translated to, to English, um, but it's about the time when he was in, in the equivalent of, of high school trying to decide what to do next. And he really wanted to be a poet, although he confesses that with all the children who want to please their mothers, he wanted to be a priest at one time, right? I can attest to that. I grew up Roman Catholic. You want to be a priest and specifically a Jesuit. So he wanted to be specifically also a Jesuit. But it's also a time of puppy love, uh, first love, whatever you want to call it. And, And so he also confesses a lot about the love that he had for this wonderful woman named Carmen. Carmen is a word, a name for a woman, which is related to the French word which we use in English, charm. Uh, so this charming woman, he fell in love with her, and um, she remained throughout his life, and even through the writing of this, of this book, the, the, this idealized lover of her life, of his life. And uh, he tells us at the end that his, her son visited him later on in Solentiname. Some of you might not have, not have heard that name, um, Solentinam is an archipelago in, in Lake Nicaragua, where Ernesto Cardenal developed these wonderful masses, and, um, and, and he invited the, the peasants and fishermen of, of Solentinam to finish the sermon. He would start the sermon with some ideas about the text, and all of that was compiled into three volumes of sermons called El Evangelion in Solentinam, the Gospel in Solentinam. Fantastic reading. And uh, you don't have to read them all at one time. I don't think I have read, that, read them all, but each of the ones that I have read, I just have absolutely loved. So this young man, the son of Carmen, visited him over there, and he said, um, he didn't say, you know, I know your mom loved me, loved you, or you loved my mom, or anything like that, but he just more confessionally was asking, you know, I don't know what to do with my life. Uh, I, I, I want to join the Sandinistas. He was uh, from very wealthy, the wealthy family. Part of me wants to be a Sandinista and fight, and part of me wants to be uh, the uh, you know participate in the capitalist system and change it. And so he just uh, was dealing with with uh, the things that that he Cardenal had dealt with uh, in the years when he was uh, writing this origin uh, when he was living these days originally. So it's a fascinating 
uh, book because it tells us about his conviction that what he really needed to do was to be a poet and how he had difficulties trying to convince his father in particular that that it was okay for him to pursue this 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 great dream because you know what Poets don't make money, you know, and, and parents are usually practical with their kids. I know that when my daughter told me that she wanted to be a singer and, and she's a great actress and all of that, but my heart sank because I lived in Hollywood. I know the kids and young people with incredible talent who do not make it, who do not make it. In fact, I know people in the business who once told me it's easier to get a gold medal in an Olympic competition than to get a, a, a good job in, in, in these kinds of other uh, endeavors because there's so much subjectivity about you know the, the talent of the person that's displaying it. So obviously Cardenal's father was a practical man and he knew you know become a lawyer or do something else with the words that you love, but don't do not become a poet. So he lied and said, okay, I'm gonna go to study law in, in Mexico. And he went to study in Mexico. And but in fact it was in Mexico that he really uh, realized that he could not uh, avoid, he could not escape his calling, that he was a real poet. And it is from Mexico that he wrote a wonderful poem about Granada, about the destruction of Granada by Walker, who was an American pirate, essentially, who invaded Nicaragua and then came to the United States and offered Nicaragua for, for Nicaragua to become another state in the United States one of the many times that Nicaragua has been invaded. So he writes about the destruction of Granada by Walker, but he weaves um, in, a, in a fantastic way his own feelings, his own love for the city, for the woman and all of that, and he called it the uninhabited city. Because in some ways, when he returned to Granada and Carmen wasn't there and his friends were not there, for all practical purposes, Granada was deshabitada, la ciudad deshabitada. So it, it was a, a wonderful piece of work which kept on growing later on. At the beginning, he did not want it to be included in the corpus of his, of his uh, um, poetic production, but eventually he was convinced that yes, it had, to, it had to be produced there. And it was in Mexico that it was written, and it was the Mexican uh, literati that first admired and confirmed to Ernesto Cardenal, you are a poet, you have to pursue that, follow it, and you, you'll be who you really need to be. His vocation to be a priest followed that. It was later on that he, that he um, um, met Mer Merton and uh, then eventually became a, a trappist. And, and then, of course, then that also blended with his Sandinismo, the realization that he had to use his words as ways of transforming the society, the Granada, the, the Nicaragua that he loved so much. So um, I want to say something else that's in here. One of his earlier poems uh, he shared with, with one of his friends, and, and you almost get the feeling like, you know, with friends like these, who needs enemies kind of a thing. Um, his friend, as he, as he was sharing this, this poem, he just scratched, you know, note here and there and there. This is, this is this other poet, this is this other poet, just like three or four other poets that he was knowingly or unknowingly including and weaving into, the, into, this, um, into this poem that he had written. And so then he showed it to this man, Coronel, that I mentioned to you earlier. And he said, do not worry. The metals may not be yours, but the bronze you put together. You created the bronze together. And I, I say this now, especially as I'm so aware of the fact that so many people um, accuse Martin Luther King of plagiarizing, uh, of not crediting the people who first said the beloved community or the arc of, of, of uh, history bends in such and such a way. Um, but it is OK not to always say who said it first. When you are actually living it, it's, that's what is so much more important. And he, he uh, uh, Martin Luther King, as well as Ernesto Cardenal, they were always using other metals, but blending them in such a way that the bronze that they were producing was really a new creation, and it was really uh, um, themselves. It was not, it was not quote, plagiarizing. Um, and the other thing is, 
this wonderful quotation about the Ark of the Universe or the beloved community might have remained totally obscure and only people like Randy Alcier would tell you who was the person who originated the idea of the beloved community or Uni Unitarian Universalists would tell you about Theodore Park, uh, you know, and uh, Parker and, and, and the uh, Ark of the Universe. And they might just have been uh, obscure little uh, trivia. Instead, they became central because of the way in which Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, presented them and lived them and, and, and inspired people to, to live them, to, to, to aim in that direction. And I think it's the same thing that was happening to Ernesto as he was writing that, that those early poems, that you know, he was borrowing here and there and everywhere, but also he was blending in, in a particular way. And I'm glad that there were enough professors and enough uh, adults that he respected that made him aware that he indeed was a poet. For Latin American poetry, even though I'm fiercely Mexican, uh, one would have to say that the two greatest poets up to now in Latin America, both of them are Nicaragua. Ruben Darío, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, and Ernesto Cardenal at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st. Those are the two greatest um, uh, poets. Uh, I know that some people like uh, Neruda, and I like Neruda too, but um, really when you compare the, the total production and, again, the transformative power, especially of Cardenal, there's just no way anybody else in Latin America is going to come anywhere near the kind of production and the kind of transformative power that Ernesto Cardenal has given to all of us through, through his, um, uh, all, all of his work altogether. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to now move to talk a little bit about how we began discovering that Ernesto was a, a fellow traveler in terms of process thought. And uh, it was um, a series of providential events. Uh, John and I have been talking a lot more about providence, that we really need to be bold and talk about providence and begin to counter the ideas the mechanistic ideas of providence where you know some some mechanically God enters into history and 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 elevate the, the fact that God is in history all the time acting through us and that is that providence and as human beings and even other elements in, in the universe respond to the prompts from from God then the providence becomes real and and, and uh, palpable um, in in, the, in this case, when, when we became aware of, of the connections with, with Cardenal, just little things that you say, well, no, yeah, yes, how did that happen? Um, I was on my way to, uh, to a conference. I happened to stop at, uh, at um, Catherine Keller's place. She was reading Versos del Pluriverso in, in English, Verses of the Pluriverse, and he, she was excitedly saying, look, uh, uh, Ernesto Cardenal mentions uh, David Bohm in one of the in one of the poems there, and I go what? So she shows it to me and she reads it to me, and by the time I get to Niagara, I send an email to John and with a copy to Pixley or maybe vice versa, and say we have to connect with this man. I come back over here, meet with John and Jorge. Uh, this was in June or July, and said you know we have to do something with you know with with uh, Cardinal, and. Lo and behold, John says, because John had seen how much the Nicaraguan people loved Jorge, mm -hmm. I think you can make it. That's providence. Each, at each of those moments, you know, if, if John had not paid attention when he went from, from um, uh, Colombia to Nicaragua with Jorge, not all of us who were in, uh, Rosemary was in, 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 in Colombia also, but not all of us went only, I think only, only uh, John and Jorge went over there, but he was able to see how the Nicaraguan people were responding to him, and he was also able to see how the Latin Americans were responding to Jorge, even in Bogota. And so he just turned to him and said, I think you can make it happen. Indeed, he could make it happen. In less than a year, we had this meeting in, in, um, in uh, Managua uh, with the presence of Ernesto Cardenal and had this 
I noticed only now that it's called the primer encuentro, the first encounter. When, when are we going to have the segundo encuentro, Mary? <laughs> Mary, Rosemary? You know, that it, was, it was interesting. It was called the primer encuentro de cosmologías, the first encounter of, cosmology, of cosmologies. Cardenal de, de Chardin and Whitehead. And it was a magnificent event. Rosemary was there and presented a paper. Um, and uh, I now have all of the papers from that, from that event. And I believe that now that we have uh, uh, Process Century Press, that we should produce the first bilingual uh, edition of, of, of what we have been doing in Latin America. And it, I mean, all of those ponencias, as they say in Spanish, they were all magnificent. And they really deserve to be shared with the rest of, of, the, of the folks that, that, um, that love the Center for Process Studies, that tried to follow uh, and learn from Cobb and from Whitehead and, and uh, Charles Harson and others like that. Um, I just want to add a couple more things. One is that because of that relationship between David Bohm and, and, and um, Ernesto Cardenal, we also understand that Ernesto Cardenal pays great attention to the scientific um, worldview, the current scientific worldview. Granted, he's far more Einsteinian than, than, than Whiteheadian in terms of he's still believing the curvature of the universe, etc. But he is, he is at least aware of the fact that, you know, the, that, that cause, uh, quantum theory and all of this have to be taken into account and have to be factored in as you do your theology and your philosophy. So it's wonderful to have him in our, uh, in, in our company. I want to refer you to, I'm not going to read it to you, but I'm going to refer you to a very recent article that appeared in the New York Times um, about <coughs> Ernesto Cardenal. Um, Ernesto was in Mexico City um, a few weeks ago, and uh, he was announcing, of course, that he is turning 90 today. Um, uh, exactly 20 days ahead of John Cobb, um, he's turning 90, and he was also unveiling his new work, 90 Poemas para mis 90 años, not 90 poems for my 90th birthday, right? So, um, and this article refers to that, and um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll bring it to you, here it is. Um, What's the date of that? Of the of the uh, article. of the article, yeah, it's in the New York Times. I'll give it to you right now. Um, um, it was Ron Phipps who uh, who um, gave me the the specifics, although I already knew that it that it was there because um, it is uh, January the third in the New York Times. www.newyorktimes.com, 2015, and that's about this great poet priest. And um, science, the title of the article is Science Fuels Writing and Faith of a Nicaraguan Poet. So that's the title of the, of, of the uh, article. Of course, those of us who, who have read him know that it's far more than just science fueling him. His, his uh, concern for the indigenous peoples of the world and the cosmologies of indigenous peoples in the world and all that. Uh, he blends, again, what he did as a young man in that first poem where he was knowingly and unknowingly quoting somebody else, now he knows, he knowingly is aware of the fact <coughs> that he's blending science and, and in, uh, the indigenous cosmologies and revolutionary ideas and all of that to produce something as beautiful as this cosmic canticle, okay? So I'm just going to read what Ron said. He had already, uh, I think, uh, had already this, uh, read the article. And it says, his poems, meaning uh, Cardenal's, are powerful and reflect awakening, staring at injustice, through, uh, at injustice, truly God-loving people attain courage and defiance without losing a drop of their humanity. A decade or so ago, Pam and I visited Nestor in his seminary in Buenos Aires. That's Nestor Miguez. He shared an office space with two other scholars, one of whom was one of two major champions of liberation theology. We sat by this historic desk sharing a bowl of mate. So it was a, it's a great um, testimonial on the part of a great American 
friend of us and, and you know, definitely supportive of process thinking. And then, then uh, supporting uh, Ernesto Carnat's poetry as being totally congruent with who we are and what we're trying to do. I just want to read a few um, lines of, of uh, his Cantiga uh, 32, which is, in the heavens there are dens of thieves. This, by the way, I think is a, a masterful translation of Cantico Cosmico. Um, I know about translations, and they're not easy to do. And poetry cannot be translated that easily. And it takes a poet who knows the two languages well to really do the job that, that, that needs to be done. And it is Lyons who does this work so well in Cantico Cosmico. So he says, in the heavens there are dens of thieves. In the beginning, in Arheim, in the beginning, what I learned from my father who knew it from his father and he from his father since way, way back from the beginning he made the stars, the moon, the animals. He said, do not steal from within your tribe. Do not devour each other in the night. Atoms from distant stars reach us, stars bearers of life. The carbon in your body was once in the incandescent atmosphere of a star and it wasn't always there from the beginning. The carbon in your body, it was synthesized in stars that died and exploded and disseminated it like pollen, pollen throughout interstellar space and it reached the earth. Life derives from the death of stars. Something to remember on any person's birthday, but now on his birthday. The iron in your blood millions of years ago was in a huge star or jeweler's gold from the explosion of supernovas, lakes, iguanas, telescopes, everything from the fire of the stars. When stars explode, they scatter the elements of life, of life like spores, death and birth, or from death you are reborn. They are atomic energy. We gaze at them up above, energy that unravels the roses on earth what kinship there is between the stars, the flowers, your face. Sweet girl, are you aware? Even in interstellar gas, even interstellar gas has the same composition as a bacteria and a girl. Their calcium dominates in the interstellar spaces, which dominate also in organic matter, and is the ash of the universe returning to the stars. Stellar species derive one from the other like animal species, birth and death, transmitting life with death. They are born from that tenuous matter, and when they die, they return their substance to it. The sun and the earth emerge from the ashes of death stars. We are made of stars. Come from the heart of the stars. We are them. I think that's something worth remembering on our birthday, no matter how good or bad we might be. And this is my concluding comment. Ernesto Cardenal shares the, the same birth, birthday, that means the 20th of January, with uh, two very interesting people uh, in, in a completely different uh, place in the, in the universe in some way. One is Bishop Minerva Carcaño. Today is her birthday. And the other is Al Capone. Al Capone was born also on January 20th. Now, they're all made out of stars. Our, our bishop, Ernesto Cardenal, you and I, and yes, Al Capone. Now, Al Capone, at least, um, one of the ways in which I like to connect them with, with our time here together, is referred to by one General Smedley Butler. Smedley Butler is the most con was the most condecorated um, Marine general, uh, uh, military general, period. And in his book, War is a Racket, he said, I was a strong man for the corporations, and I could have taught Mr. Capone a lesson or two. He, after all, operated only in five counties. I operated in five continents. And it's something worth remembering, and it's something worth passing around. Today, as I was trying to make a reservation for a flight. This young woman asked me on the phone, are you in the military? There are discounts for the military. I said, I am a pastor and I deserve as much of a, a discount as people in the military. Why are you favoring the military? Because they are serving our country. I said, they are serving our country or our corporations? Who do I write about this whole thing? You know? And she says, 
www. Is <laughs> That's where I was supposed to write about that. But I think it's the kind of thing that you can share, not perhaps not as angrily as I shared it with her, but you know, sometimes in the in the um, line waiting for the cashier, you know, or uh, line waiting at the uh, DMV or whatever it is, it's important to drop those little things, those important insinuations that there are things to be corrected, that 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 our words need to be elements of change. Whether we are poets in the sense of really sitting down and, 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 and polishing a, a, a beautiful piece of work, or simply just disseminating this seed here and this seed there, I think that's all part of the, of the creativity, the poesis that needs to be done by each and every one of us. I'll stop there and see whether you can see if I generated some things. We have also managed to to seduce you to look deeper into this book or any of, of, of his books. Thank you. <laughs> well, you seduced me enough that I'd be happy to hear you read a little bit more. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll select another, another <laughs> uh, part here. Who's the, pub uh, who's the publisher? Uh, I'm sorry? Who's the publisher? Of the book? Um, I'll tell you right now. It's Curbstone Press, C-U-R-B, Curbstone Press. Uh, it says it, this book was published with the support of the Connecticut, Connecticut Commission on the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and donations received from many individuals. Um, well, since we're so concerned about Mother Earth, I'm going to read a little bit from Gaia, uh, Cantiga 11, um, 81. Again, Gaia. In the beginning, there was a turbulence. The Spirit of God was stirring. In the beginning was Chaos, father of Gaia, goddess of the earth. Once there would have been only tenuous matter spread uniformly throughout space. The primeval chaos which produced the first perturbation, first condensations of the most tenuous nebulae. The condensations compressed into stars. Those believed to be newest they called nova and supernova. Ironically, because they are the destruction of a star. But a supernova created at least one new star, the sun. As the earth maintains the moon revolving around it, the sun maintains the earth and the rest of the planets in circles around it. The planets were born as condensations of gas torn away from the sun. They compress, becoming liquid and then solid. The sun and its children, the planets, the planets and their offspring, the satellites, revolving around the sun. Their unequal distances around the sun produce, as they move together, a harmony to the Greeks, like the uneven lengths of the lyre strings as they move together. Mercury, first with its elliptical orbit and no atmosphere, the most desolate of all planets. Then Venus, with its yellowish atmosphere of sulfuric acid, the Earth with its, with its moon, and Mars, its pinkish atmosphere of carbon dioxide and two moons, the 60,000 asteroids, planetary debris, giant Jupiter with its multicolored stormy atmosphere with 16 moons, Saturn, immense, but they rings and Uranus of frozen rings, Neptune, pale green and little brightness with two moons, and much further out, the last one, Pluto, the planet with the longest year, two and a half time our century, and the coldest with one moon. The 58 moons rotating on their axis and around their planets, and the planets on their axis and around the sun, and the sun turning on its axis. And with all the planets and moons rotating in the galaxy towards the constellation of Hercules and the lyre and the galaxy rotating around other galaxies and all of it rotating around what or whom? Whom capitalized interest? The largest living creature on Earth is the Earth. We've seen it, we've seen it in the photos. 
sapphire spear amid white fleeces and gleaming white skull caps at its poles. The new notion of Gaia, a living earth, the planet earth, all of it a single living being. It was so long before there was life, in quotes, on its surface. There is nowhere to live except in the sky. Therefore, having emerged from the sun's equatorial region, it became round in order to spin. living being round and spin and spin around the sun. It revolved quick five hours days and five hour nights, the moon already creating tides even then. By itself it created conditions for supporting organisms and later organisms with consciousness, people, and later an organism which is both community and individuals. Burning and arid, smoldering, gushing forth lava, molten glass, it seemed that the earth had no future. Who'd have said, who would have said that from that flaming magma, words and cities and songs and nostalgias would emerge? But rains came. The rains evaporated and on and on it rained. Torrential rain fell for 100,000 years. A thousand million times it traveled around the sun devoid of life. At that stage, the globe would not have been blue and white with pinkish land. The sun always the color of twilight, the sky color of dried leaves and the sea coffee in that color. Gray waves breaking on the gray and dead earth. The eolic erosion of rocks was for life. Continents very different from those today floated adrift. Everest was pushing up two inches a year. The sky began to turn blue as it filled with oxygen. The sky gradually turned blue because the sea was turning green with life. And later the earth green, chlorophyll and oxygen, all green and blue. We had a wet planet and already cooled down for life. Still little chemical difference between cell and non-cell. At first life was merely a purplish greenish tint. Microcosms that lives on, that lives on within us. Certain anomalous qualities of water with exceptional properties of radiation and temperature, etc., until it became the dynamic system we call life. First in a foaming slime, perhaps, certainly microscopic, but already with mouths, open microscopic mouths, avid mouths, still without song, and then later with fins, fins foreshadowing the wing and the hand. First life was very aqueous, del delicate, slight and left no fossils, not even microscopic ones. Later, there are limulus fossils copulating in the Cambrian. There, there were still no lobsters, oysters, or fish. The step onto land was like a trip to another planet. The organisms were crushed by their own weight, whence bones and skin, pelts, integument, integuments against the direct light of the sun which fell on the earth. And the dryness, which is why water had to be carried internally, Vertebrates on land, we continue to be aquatic. Seals, dolphins, whales prefer to return to the water. The essential act of procreation is always in water. And swimming in the waters of the womb, the embryo grows. And humans still sweat and weep seawater. On its own, the globe learned to cover itself with plant-sustaining soil. It is a living earth, all of it palpitating. Stone also vibrates, although slowly. In its core, the planet palpates, a living body which wanders through the sky among the stars. An atmosphere protects us from harmful radiations. The sun, which give, gives us light, allows us to sleep. A cell is not just its molecules, and an organism is not just its cells. So this living planet is not merely its li living creatures. It keeps on going on, but... The thing to remember is that, you know, that when he was writing this, um, he was not as aware of the threat to the very things that he is that he is describing, you know, the, that now Gaia is being threatened in so many ways. This the the the, the polar um, uh, references, uh, they, they wouldn't look they don't look like that today from space. They will not look Earth, that beautiful blue marble no longer looks like that. Hence, it really behooves us to to indeed be defenders of the earth, of whatever is left of the earth. Hence, I hope everybody has signed up already for June 4th through 7th for seizing an alternative. <clears throat>
you have the Port Laureate of the conference with yes. us today, who is also the Port Laureate of the Pilgrim Place celebration. Yes. <clears throat> yes, I was very much aware of that when I first came in. Pat and I go back a long, long time to the days on the Board of Global Ministries. We were, we were part of that group that uh, witnessed the transformation of the Board of Missions into the Board of Global Ministries. And Tracy Jones and all of those folks, you know, the shenanigans and wheeling and dealing and <laughs> all of that. that created. And then I don't know how you emerged being uh, as a poet in the midst of all of that, um, you know. Politics. Huh? In the, in the midst of all those politics. <laughs> But poetry is more recent <laughs> when I have time. Wonderful. It's never too late. In the case of Cardenal, it was a very early longing. And for some of us, it might just come late. You know, it's kind of interesting. When I was, um, I only remember two lines that I wrote. I remember another one, but it was such plagiarism. that It was a Mother's Day poem that I wrote, and I used a song I knew that it was a song uh, that, you know, and, and I just changed a few things and I, it appeared in the newspaper. So. <laughs> but the other two lines did not appear in the newspaper. And, and it's interesting because um, I don't remember anything else that I wrote, but I know that the end of the poem said, que mi, nombre se, que mi nombre se escriba en la historia, señor, dame esa gloria. And, you know, I don't know what else I said before that, but that, those were the last two lines. Let my name be written in history. Oh, Lord, grant me that glory. <laughs> so it, I don't know what else I had said, but I must have been about 15, 16 years old when I wrote that. So um, I guess we all want some way of being remembered, even when we're that young, you know. Les. Um, in Europe, uh, writers and poets have a very special political role and have had uh, exact. Um, through history, and mm -hmm. certainly in my native country in Hungary, right. history, but in, in Russia with Pushkin and his connection to the Decembrists, Lamartine. Yep. Uh, is it uh, similar in uh, Nicaragua? Well, now, it's, now it has become that way, and I think that's precisely why I think that a project like the one I'm suggesting is worth pursuing. You know, that, that uh, looking at, um, at uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, all of these places that have produced such activist poets, you know, that they, they were um, using their words to, to really transform their societies. By the way, there's also personal transformation that is very important. One of the most um, um, interesting Mexican-American poets is Jimmy Santiago Baca. Jimmy Santiago Baca wrote uh, his autobiographical book is called A Place to Stand, and he's got about three, three uh, books. And Santiago Baca was a criminal. And, you know, he, he, um, he served time, and one of the things that he had to do in, in, when he finally got caught, and only in his, only in his uh, um, book, in his autobiographical book, does he say, well, I really did not commit the crime for which I was convicted, but I had committed so many others, it was my time anyway. So, so, so he had accepted that. And then the role that he had was to, secure, to work at the library, at the prison library, and to always bring two or three books to sneak them into the, into the jail in order for that to be used as fuel to heat the water to make coffee or some cold, hot drink in the middle of the night. And one of the days he began tearing a book apart, and guess what it was? It was a book of poetry, and it was a book by Wordsworth. And he begins to read the poems, and then the other, the, the other inmates are mad at him because he's not doing his job. But then he begins to realize, wow, this is really something. That, so his personal transformation was really incredible. And then he began writing love letters for the other, for the, for the, uh, other prisoners. And that's how he began writing poetry. And then one guy said to him, you know, some people get paid for doing what you're doing. You know? And he had a, a <coughs> shoebox filled with poems. And he sent them on. And several of them began to be published. And he got paid. That's how he understood himself. Um, that's how he grew to be the poet that he became. And when he left the, the jail, eventually he made his way to become an adjunct professor at Yale. So I would, I would actually rename the cover of the book and say, you know, from jail to Yale. <laughs> but what, what he said is, 
all this anger that I had inside of me and I had no words for them. And when you read his poetry, when you read about the time he accompanied his grandfather in New Mexico to a government office and his sense of powerlessness and at the powerlessness of his grandfather and his own, you know, the combined powerlessness, you know, you can see why he turned into a criminal. But thank God that he discovered Wordsworth and he discovered words. And then he began expressing all that rage in a more creative way and transforming himself. So Jimmy Santiago Vaca is somebody that I highly uh, recommend for you to read about. You know, any of his books is good, but a place to stand is, is his biographical statement. And um, talk about, again, providence. You know, I was, I was um, flipping through the channels waiting for, interesting enough, the um, uh, critiques of the State of the Union and and the next person was going to be uh, Bush. And I said, I don't want to watch this. And then somebody says, Jimmy Santiago Vaca. And I said, oh, yeah, I want to see what this. And that's how I found out about Jimmy Santiago Vaca. You know, just, just holding that channel changer a few seconds more allowed me to then hear the story about Jimmy Santiago Vaca. Vaca. And then I bought, the, I bought the books and all of that. But it's, it's, it's amazing how just, you know, just instantaneously you get sometimes these prompts or these hold back, you know, that, and we need to just say, that is not, it's not a big boy, voice talking to us or anything like that. It's those tiny little things that are always prompting us to do X or Y or Z. Okay, I guess some of you need to go to uh, <laughs> Pilgrim Place. Now, thank you very much for showing up. I would have done it in nobody could. I know. I, <laughs> I think Ernesto deserves that. Uh, and since we are going to, they, we're, we're sending this to uh, uh, Nicaragua, you know, Pet, um, Herges might be watching now. If not, he will watch uh, the uh, archived thing. So uh, I hope uh, Ernesto knows that we, we did celebrate his, his birthday and, and wish him many, many more, hopefully a centennial. Thank you.